Hello, hello. Welcome back to the Story Darlings podcast. I'm Sandra. And I'm Tara. And before we jump into today's stuff, I wanted to give a quick shout out to everyone who's been watching and reading along and just sharing the episodes as we release them. Michael, Arthur, Mary Lily, Carolyn, Danielle, Kat, Josephine, Vanessa, Jane Rose, my coworker. If you're listening, I'm so sorry that you got spoiled on the first episode, but hopefully you picked up the books and you're reading along now. So sorry about that. And then I wanted to give special shout outs to Jesse from Jim Was Cancelled, the Buffy podcast, our pod, Hannah and Laura over there, and Fiction Fans podcast. I just want to thank you guys for sharing the episodes whenever we post those. So thank you so much. Era Fire ended with Selena becoming Aelin and fully embracing her heritage, her name, her legacy. And so the last sentence of Era Fire was, my name is Aelin Ashriver Galathinius, and I will not be afraid. And then Tara and I decided to kind of pump the brakes and jump back into the Assassin's Blade, which is basically the prequel collection of novellas. And we got to see an origin story for that phrase. We got to visit some characters that were mentioned throughout the books that we've read so far and just get more information about them. So it was kind of a refresher too, as we continue the story from Queen of Shadows on. You see why that book is placed where it is, because when you dive into this book, a lot of the events that happen in Assassin's Blade are fresh on your mind and they are pivotal in some of the events that are happening in Queen of Shadows. Queen of Shadows, this is covering part one, what, 47, 48 chapters, something like that. It was so long. Tara, your text message cracked me up. I don't know how we're going to keep straight everything that happened in this episode because good Lord, there is so much that happens. So if we forget your favorite part or just mangle this all to pieces because we're trying to go in an order and it doesn't work, I apologize. But it is a great read. There's so much that happens and I couldn't put it down. So I also finished my reading really soon for this so I have a memory problem as well but it's just so good so Queen of Shadows opens with part one I forget what it was called like Lady of Shadows I think is what part one is called or something like that Lady of Shadows it opens with a really interesting POV. So Air Fire left us very worried for one of our beloved characters in recent times. And what's going on over there? So poor Adian is stuck in prison and he's awaiting his death. But he also knows that the king is using him to get Selena to come back. And so he is wishing for his death to happen sooner so that he couldn't be used as bait for Selena or Aelin as he knows her. And... Poor dude. He's got like this little like cut somewhere. I think it's on his side, but I can't remember for sure. And he's got an infection and he knows he's dying. And he's like trying to trick everybody around him to think that he's just disappointed because he's about to die or whatever. And so he's trying to get them to let him die of his illness before Aelin arrives. Yes, he's being very hush hush about it. And then when we pop over to Prince Dorian's head, there's all kinds of crazy shit happening. So tell us what's going on with the crown prince if he's even the crown prince yeah yeah well he's a prince there are many princes now we do find that out Yes. So when we left off, his dad had slapped that little iron collar on him. As we know, bad news bears for the iron collars because something happens to the people when they get those put on and the king can kind of control them. And we learned through this book that that collar basically allows one of the Vogue into the body of the person. And Dorian, poor, poor Dorian, is losing himself to this Vogue creature that has now entered his body and we see at the beginning that he remembers nothing like he's basically lost his humanity he remembers nothing except for Sorsha's death and the Vogue keeps using that against him and it's so sad yeah it's so fucked up it's just replaying her beheading over and over and he is conscious that he is losing his memory and all those parts of himself and I think it's pictured where there's a actual physical wall that he keeps trying to lay the brick down to separate himself from this vogue entity that is just breathing down his neck, essentially. And he's losing. Like, it's whittling away at that wall little by little, and he is just coming to pieces. 
really, and is ready for it to end because he doesn't trust himself and he can't take control of himself anymore. You know, it says smile, he smiles. If it says, you know, talk to this person, he goes and talks to that person. So he has no autonomy whatsoever anymore. So then we fast forward to our main girl, Aelin now we will call her. And Aelin has spent almost a year in Wendland and she is back in Otterland. She is walking through the streets of Rifthold and it feels like a very, very different place from when she left it. There are people walking around very worried, very paranoid and scared. There are regular rounding up of people, especially of people of magical bloodline, even if that magic isn't expressed anymore. And they are just being rounded up and murdered in the streets as public show. It's a very, very different place. And she is going to a little appointment to our favorite place, the vaults, to uh, meet with someone and to watch someone and what goes on there? What do we see? So we see that Arabin is meeting with somebody and she knows who that somebody is and it's Kale. And she is wondering what the fuck <laughs> Kale is doing meeting with Arabin. And when I read the last part, I got the sense that she was coming back just to get her necklace from Arabin. And I was really pissed off because the last part of Assassin's Blade showed us exactly who Arabin was. And I'm like, please, Lord, do not fall under his spell again. Kill him. Do something bad to him. And so we see her coming in and just kind of watching him and trying to figure out how best to use him in her current predicament. Leading up to this moment at the vaults, we see her go to like the shadow markets, hanging around, spotting people that work under Arabin, and she kind of lures them back to the vaults. And so after Kaol leaves, she doesn't say anything to him. In fact, she's dodging him and trying to stay out of sight. And there's like a mysterious woman that is with Kaol that she's just like, who, who the hell is that? Which we'll find out later. But Kaol finally leaves and she just goes over and confronts Arabin. And it is quite the reunion between the two of them. He has a proposal for her, as he always does, as the king of assassins, and he wants a Volg commander, someone up there that he can interrogate or use to get more information, probably power, because it's always his end goal. And what does he call her? What does he tell her that people say about her? <laughs> so her nickname, back in Otterland, is the fire-breathing bitch queen. <laughs> Hey, I would own it. I mean, it's not incorrect. <laughs> She's like, okay, I'll take it. I'll own it. And she, in exchange, asks for Arabin's help in saving Adian. And he's like, okay, you know, I'll do that. You get me a Vol commander, I'll do what I can. And he just goes on trying to capture her back into his little alluring, because he's not alluring, web. And there's a quote that he says to her on page 23, and he tries to do this like romantic villain type of quote. And it was, tell me what I must do to atone. Tell me to crawl over hot coals, to sleep on a bed of nails, to carve up my flesh. Say the word and it is done, but let me care for you as I once did before, before that madness poisoned my heart. Punish me, torture me, wreck me, but let me help you. Do this small thing for me and let me lay the world at your feet. And I'm just like, dude, you are so fucking gross and just, he makes my skin crawl. I have two comments. A, the amount of eye rolls... <laughs> <laughs> when I am thinking about talking about whatever Arabin, they're just they're just there, like eh. But B, that is such a grooming like comment. Like, oh yeah, I did bad, I'll do better. He has no intention of doing better. No intention. <sighs> I know. It was so gross. There was a point you made about like she wants his help with Adian, and he he's like, Yeah, get me this commander and I'll help you. And he I don't think had the intention to help her if she agreed to that because he would have already had his thing. And so she wisely is like, no, we're going to help Adian first because he's going to be put to death in like a matter of days. So no, we're going to help him first and then I'll get you your person. And in her head, she's like, I may get you your person if it suits me. But still, he had no intention of helping her. Yeah. Because it's just another guy to take her attention away from him. Aelin always has plans cooking up in the background. And I, what I love about her character is she is so shrewd. She is always thinking many steps ahead. She doesn't trust anyone. And so she always has a backup plan. And she is always scheming. And I really appreciate that about her. So after Arabin finally leaves, all of this stuff that she was doing, you know, walking around the shadow markets and stuff, she lures 
lures some men <laughs> to the vaults. And one of my favorite lines happens like following the scene because she ends up, she fucking hates the vaults because of everything that goes on there. It's just so bad. Trashes the place, kills the owners. And she says, what a shame that the current owner of the vaults, a former underling of Rourke Farron and a dealer of flesh and opiates had accidentally run into her knives repeatedly. And <laughs> I was just laughing. So is that like... I, I forget what musical that's in, but like, I think it's Chicago where the l- wife's like, he ran into my knife eight <laughs> times. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. Yep. It's so funny. I just like her internal dialogue so much, just getting a glimpse behind everything that she's thinking about things. So then Aelin flees to the sewers because there are some that are just chasing after her that are stronger than others. And so a lot of this book is spent in the sewers. There's a lot going on in these underground tunnels. Which if you remember, the sewer is her favorite place on (laughs) earth. (laughs) From Assassin's Blade, where she nearly died in the sewers. Yeah. Yes. And had to take like 20 showers to feel clean again. And so she is in the sewers and... From her conversation with Erebin earlier, he told her to go to like the southeast end of it or something like that. And so she's making her way down there and she sees that mysterious woman that was with Kaol in the vaults. And they have an exchange and they don't like each other. They don't trust each other. But she finds out that this woman is a part of the rebel cause working with Kaol, who shows up. And their reunion is not warm and fuzzy (laughs) at all. Kale is a dickhead. This is why I don't like to ship people in the first book, because shit always happens. And they become the worst. Well, I guess he's not the worst person in this, but he is like up there on my list of like, what the hell? What the hell is he thinking? But yes, he still blames Aelin, Selena, whatever we want to call her now, for like pretty much everything that's going wrong in his life. He doesn't blame the king so much. He does, but like he holds a shit ton of resentment for Aelin. And some of it might be founded, but most of it's not. And he's just looking for somebody to blame. Like he even blames her for what happened to Dorian and what happened to Sorsha because over in this other continent... She did something. And I'm like, dude, no, it's the king's fault that he beheaded somebody and put a collar on his son. It's not her fault for standing up for herself over here. He is so easily swayed by the propaganda over in the Empire. He was in a relationship of sorts with her, and he wanted to marry her. I mean, it got that serious that he was having those feelings about her and thinking about leaving everything behind to be with her. But all of this is just proven that he still doesn't see her for who she is. Like, he still doesn't get that. He sees all this propaganda about, oh, the fire-breathing bitch queen almost destroying an entire city, steaming the river and just blazing everything. And he doesn't question that at all. He just takes that as truth. Like she is some kind of threat instead of trusting his gut with who she is. And it's just so frustrating. I'm like, I want us to move past this, Kaol. This is so ridiculous. At this point, I think it's just something with his personality. Like, I don't think we're going to move it past it because he doesn't want to grow. He wants to live in his own little like, oh, black and white, you're at fault because you were this. Like he doesn't want to see past that. And it's so frustrating because he could have been so good. He could have been so helpful. And at first I thought he was going to be because when we get reintroduced to him, he is fighting against what the king is doing. He is trying to free the people that are going for executions. He's helping free Adian and those things. So I was like, okay, finally, Kale like has grown a brain and we've moved past it. But then he's just such a dick to her. And he's like, it's all your fault. Like everything's your fault. And I'm like, it can't be all her fault. Yeah, he treats her like such an adversary all the time instead of just saying, you know, we're working toward the same thing. Ultimately, like he wants to save what he can and salvage the kingdom. He wants Prince Dorian to lead the kingdom. He's doing all of these things that would redeem some of the shit that he has done by smuggling people out and trying to work with Arabin to kill the king, which is what he wants and why he's been talking to Arabin. But honestly, Kaol is just not smart enough to deal with Arabin and to maneuver around him so he should just watch his back if he's doing that anyway he's catching up with Aelin and he's kind of downloading on everything that's been going on so Aelin's dog Fleetfoot has been staying with this mysterious woman Nezrin Falik 
like at her parents who are bakers in the city and just that kind of thing. He also tells her a piece of information, which is that he has figured out how to take down or how to bring magic back, basically. But he won't tell her because he doesn't want her to be able to use magic. And I'm like... I don't get your logic here, dude. Like, he's afraid that if magic comes back, then the magic wielders will take over. I'm like, it's it's kind of like magic wielders, a king that's like tyrannical, like killing people you obviously do not agree with. You're like avoiding a bad that you don't know is actually going to happen and okay with a bad that you know is happening. I don't get it. Yeah, it goes back to that black and white view of the world that he is subscribing to, which is so stupid. Aelin gives the ring back too. She's just like, hey, you know, here's this amethyst ring that you gave me. And he goes and pawns it. So they are totally done. It's almost like a just a closing of that book and they are now just fully moving forward. You also see him kind of being jealous because he knows something is going on with her and Rowan, this guy that he just has heard about. And he makes some offhanded comments about like, where's your boyfriend kind of things. And I'm like, dude, you think she's the worst person on earth and you are not supportive. You are not anything. And you're still Still making dumbass comments about her moving on. But then also, he's worried about these magic users taking over. But the world existed for like the whole time with magic users able to use their magic and they didn't try and take over. So again, I'm like, where, where is this coming from? Is it because the magic users were persecuted so much that you think that they're going to be pissed off when they do get their magic back and take over? Maybe, yeah. Maybe it's his guilty conscience talking because he worked on the bad side for so long and he's just not facing that. That's a good call out. Like he's on the right side. He just doesn't give his full to the right side. He doesn't like that he's on that side. He wants to pick and choose. Yeah. And very much like what Dorian said he was doing with Selena. He was picking and choosing the parts that he loved. And that's not like you, you either love a person or you don't. You don't love them to make them change. Exactly. After that just scene, which good riddance, honestly, we go to Mora, where Duke Parrington has been absent the last book or two. All we know is he went to Morath with Roland and Caltaine to make Caltaine his bride. And we see that Caltaine has been collared by Duke Parrington, and she is a shell of a person. Like, she is not treated like a human being anymore. And it's very sad how these scenes describe her affect and just how she just goes through the motions as a bit of a zombie, just a ghost, really. And it's sad. And we also see that she doesn't talk. She's just, like Sandra said, a shell. I think she still has bruises and stuff like that. She has like this weird thing going on around her elbow, which we'll learn about later what that entails. It's not looking too good with her. She looks like she has been through it in her time at Morath and it's um, it's a shame. And so we get Manon's perspective of Caltaine, which is really just Manon doesn't care. Manon's kind of just singularly minded about, I want the witch kingdom back. I'm going to do whatever my grandmother says begrudgingly and I don't care what the cost is, we are going to get our land back. And that's all she cares about. We do get to see more exchanges with the 13 and especially Astrin, who is her second and then is demoted because Astrin actually has a conscience and is speaking up and not afraid to speak her mind to Manon, much to her detriment. And so she is demoted to third and then I think to like fourth at some point later. Well, and then we also see a new character named Lead, and she is the niece of, I forgot the Lord's name. Vernon. He was the Lord of Pranth or something like that, right? Yeah, he was the brother of Elide's father, who we heard about previously in a book. Yes. And I did not put two and two together on that one. And so the whole book, I was thinking, wait, wait, is she? Is she? Is she? And then she is the daughter of Marion. And so you see her and her life sucks too. Her uncles, like all these men are just like so horrible, such horrible human beings. And I really, really hope that they get their just desserts at some point because horrible human beings. So this is his niece, her mom and dad, both dead. She is under his care. 
I don't know if there was an accident or something, but you see that she is hobbling. There's something wrong with her leg and she is chained and she is basically a servant in this house going to get food and whatever for the witches. So you see this, you feel horrible for this girl because her life just sucks. It's much like Kaltain, but a little bit, I guess at least she has her consciousness. Um, so a little bit better, but she is taking care of the witches and she forms a somewhat okay relationship with Manon in her second and third. Manon figures out through tasting her blood, and I forgot how she tasted her blood. I was trying to remember, but she tastes her blood and Manon figures out that she has witch blood in her. And so if she wants to decide that she is a witch, she is under the witch's protections. And so Manon starts using her to get information about what is freaking going on in Morath because the Duke has asked for a coven of witches to be basically vessels for the Vogue to procreate. And at first Manon's like, fuck this shit. No, I'm not turning over witches to you. And then her grandmother's like, you're turning over witches. And Manon doesn't go against her grandmother. And so she turns over witches. Granted, they volunteered for it. It is the yellow legs coven yeah or a yellow legs coven and so they volunteered for it Manon's like fine they volunteered you can have them enlists a lead to kind of see what the hell's going on and a lead goes down and she sees that this is not like a normal procreation kind of a thing going on the witches have all already had multiple babies or at least one baby and on to the second baby and they aren't witchlings they are something different they are creatures Rightfully so, she's a little freaked out about what's going on. This is fucked up on a couple different levels. So not only it being for a bad cause, which is to add to their ranks in this evil army. Secondly, it just being they're turned into just, I don't want to call them just breeding cows, but that's what they've essentially become. And the room- Incubators. Mm -hmm, is described as these women are laid out on altars. There is a Volg prince in the room watching and making sure nothing happens with the mother. And they're being embedded with a stone that impregnates them. And they are churning out babies like it's no one's business. And third, the fucked up thing about this is this yellow legs coven that graciously volunteered to do this, this was supposed to be an honor to the witches. It is an honor and a privilege to be able to give birth to witches because they only give birth to females. It's hard to reproduce. Like maybe they'll give birth to one witch if they're lucky in their lifetime. So it is an honor. They're turning like a cultural aspect of this witch clan and just turning it on its head and it's just awful i'm gonna point out a fourth like <laughs> atrocity with this is that we have seen even through like manon's not disagreeing with her grandma even though she knows that this is a bad situation that the witches are kind of forced to listen to what their matriarchs say you also have these lower level witches basically being forced into this situation where their bodies are being taken over. And I know Sandra said that like this is supposed to be an honor. It's still not their choice of how it happens. And it's still not their choice to be locked in this room and all of that. They kind of got told from their higher ups that you are going to do this. So for the individual witch that this is happening to, it's even more atrocious because they're having that autonomy taken away from them. And you see that when a lead finds them and they're kind of like begging for it to stop. Like even if they did agree with it at the beginning, they no longer agreed to it. It's just another tactic like using something that is supposed to be so special to these witches. It's just another thing that Duke Parrington and the King of Otterland are exploiting to work and get what they want. And it's just really disgusting. Yeah, that was like one of the hardest scenes Honestly, like in the first part, it's just these women being treated like animals and not actual people. It's just really, really, really sad. And back over to Riftold. We go back to Aelin's apartment and Arabin is sending gifts left and, left and right to try and get what he wants. It's, it's so like, dude, everybody can read you. We know what your end game is. So I can't remember what Arabin gifts her. Like he sends her a present and this is when Lysandra is over there and the letter. He sends her her suit back. Okay. Yeah. So he sends her suit back and Lysandra is there and Aelin still doesn't trust Lysandra because she grew up with Lysandra being the 
airheady, like mean girl kind of situation. But we learn a little bit more about Lysandra. Well, a lot more about Lysandra. <laughs> but right now, yeah. <laughs> um, when we meet Lysandra, she has a little girl with her. I don't know how old. I'm 11. I don't know. I was thinking like 11, mm -hmm. but I could be wrong on that age. And so she has a little girl with her. Her name's Evangeline. And in Selena Aylin's mind, she is using this little girl to make sure that she is an attack. Like, it's like a, you know, you can't kill me in front of a little kid, can you? Like, you have some morals, right? Because um, the last time they saw each other, Aelin had thrown a dagger at her head. <laughs> yes, yes. Aelin is not a fan of Lysandra and made it abundantly clear. But anyway, so we meet Lysandra again. She has Evangeline with her and Aelin's a bit standoffish, even though Lysandra is, you know, there on Arabin's like bidding and supposedly helping her. She's just a bit standoffish and she tells her to leave. Evangeline leaves with, well, is going to leave with her but has some parting words for Aelin. And those are basically telling her that the reason Lysandra is still in the clutches of Clarice is because she scarred Evangeline's face intentionally with Evangeline's like blessing to do this so that Evangeline couldn't be sold into the sex trade. That was their way of making her ugly enough that nobody would want to buy her. And Evangeline really didn't want to be sold into that. So Lysandra gave her her way out and in doing so brought a lot of debt onto herself because Clarice made Lysandra pay for what she would have gotten out of Evangeline. And so when Aelin left, Selena left, and had just thrown the dagger at Lysandra. Lysandra was just a couple weeks away from being out of debt with Clarice and being able to live her own life. And she took that away from herself to let this little girl be free. I cannot fault Lysandra <laughs> I was, anymore. I was going to say, I in Tara's it. love language, this translates to Aelin having all the feelings and understanding now for Lysandra and better understanding and like trusting her a little bit more. And we also hear something else about Lysandra, which is that she was in love with Wesley. And if you remember, Wesley was the guard to Arabin and also the one who killed Farron in response to Sam's death. And he's also the one that tried to warn Selena that it was a trap before she went in to avenge. And we hear that Arabin killed Wesley and that they had this big battle and Wesley scarred Arabin. He has a new scar in response to that because Arabin was not happy that he killed Farron. He killed Wesley. Lysandra was in love with Wesley. So she, even if she did have some tie to Arabin, it ended. It ended for her. She is no longer on his side. She wants revenge for Wesley's death. And so she is ready to team with our dear fire-breathing bitch queen. Girl power. To get that. Yeah. And that's also the way that Selena gets the proof or the kind of backing of the fact that she thought Erbin had something to do with Sam's death. And this is her proof. This is her, yes, you were correct in what you were thinking and that Erbin was heavily tied and even requested some torture be done to Sam because he was mad that she picked Sam over him. It was a special treat to see the relationship develop between Lysandra and Aelin. But before we show that part, so back back with poor Adian Ash River rotting away in prison, he gets a visit from our once beloved Prince Dorian, who it, he's just like straight up just Volg Prince right now. And he's essentially spying on Adian and learns that Adian has been concealing this wound in his side that has become horribly infected and goes and reports back to the king so that the king can send in a healer to patch him up and get him all ready for Dorian's birthday celebration. Which I know is done for a horrible reason, but thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for doing that because you thought you were doing something bad, but it actually turned out good. So I'm happy for you, Dorian. Thank you. But we also see there a little bit of an inkling that whatever is going on with the prince in Dorian's body is very similar to what happened with Maeve and the, what are they, what does she call them? The, not cavalry. Oh, the. What, what are the like five little cadre? friends of Rowan? The cadre. Cadre. I knew it started with a C. Um, the cadre, because 
if she asks them something, they have to answer. And the same thing happened when Dorian was with the king. He asked, like, you know, what's going on? And Dorian had to answer him. So you see something very similar with that relationship of what's going on. There is so much of people just being taken over by whether it's, Uh you know, breeding them, possessing them, like, you know, like a demon, essentially. Blood oathing them. Blood oathing. Yeah, so much just ownership over other people. So wrong. (sighs) And that was totally a word, I'm sure. Sure, blood oathing is a is a verb. <laughs> and then one of my favorite things that Aelin does, just because it's her swagger, her personality, how she carries herself, is she just invites herself to things. Like she figures out that things are going on that she's not supposed to know about and just kind of invites herself and walks in. So she does this to Kaol while he's planning like a, a palace coup, essentially, to save Dorian. So she just shows up and he's just like, what the fuck? Like who told her about it? And she's just like, do, do you think I'm an idiot, basically? And so they're discussing how to do this and butting heads because in Kaol's mind if Aelin is involved there's going to be so many innocent people killed and like you cannot involve her and she's just like okay make everyone wear red flower that's how I'll be able to tell you know he's like okay (laughs) and then you also see him being upset because she won't tell him that she will not kill Dorian because she's been in that where they're sucking you dry and they're just making your life miserable and they're reminding you of all the bad memories you have which they are kind of doing to Dorian and so she won't tell him yes I will not kill him she says I will see if he's still there before I kill him kind of a thing and he isn't having that he's like no you need to promise me that you won't kill him or I will kill Adian and this is one of my favorite quotes because bitch queen came out and I'm going to read it now because (laughs) I love it so much. She says, you bring my court into this Kale and I don't care what you were to me or what you have done to help me. You betray them. You hurt them. And I don't care how long it takes or how far you go. I'll burn you and your God's damned kingdom to ash. Then you'll learn just how much of a monster I can be. And I'm like, (laughs) yes. (laughs) Fine. Finally, she's like shutting his shit down and putting him in his place. It's like he. She's like, you want to see bad? I'll show you bad. Like you have not seen it because you have not hurt anybody that I care about. Mm -hmm. But I will show you. Mm -hmm. One of the other parts that happens is the bonding between Aelin and Lysandra. It happens more which is so fun because we haven't seen Aelin this happy since Nehemia, like just hanging out in the bedroom, talking gossip, just being, you know, girly girl kind of fun. And so we get to see like Sandra and Aelin talk about like chocolate and all of the luxuries of life and stuff. Such a fun scene. There was a foreshadowing moment in like one scene in particular that I wanted to just quickly share. It was on page 120. Lysandra says, you and I are nothing but wild beasts wearing human skins. Don't even try to deny it. And so we have like that little foreshadowing moment there that you just don't think anything of when you see that scene. But all of the good vibes and everything that comes out of them bonding over just their shared goals and all of the hardships that they've been through because Lysandra has not had it easy. Even before she became employed under Clarice, Lysandra had a very tough life. I'm trying to decide whether we just jump into it now. Just Just jump jump in. in. She had... Her life mirrored yes. Selena's a lot with her parents and stuff. So she has a good sense of what Elena went mm-hmm. through. And which is just another thing that tightens the bond between them two. And so we learn where Lysandra was, you know, a decade ago when all of this shit happened and magic disappeared from the continent. And Lysandra was basically living like a street urchin. She had a horrible relationship with her mother. Her mother disowned her, kicked her out of the house and then moved so that Lysandra couldn't find her. And she did that to her when she was just a small, small girl and never knew her father. And it turns out that her father was a shape shifter. And so Lysandra is a shapeshifter. And we see, you know, in Lysandra telling Aelin about her upbringing that before she came under Clarice, she was living on the streets. She would turn herself into a cat, you know, turn herself into various animals, into leaders of children gangs to get food to eat and survive before she finally was stuck in this beautiful face that she dons. And she can't even 
like remember what her original face looked like. It's very her power is very much dependent on her memory and, and being able to pick those details of you know what she physically looked like and she can't remember anymore. So now she's kind of stuck with this face and stuck in this form. That was just kind of a little like a little wake up call for me where I got like, oh, I feel so bad for you. Any any children hardship that they have to do just the impossible to get by. It just tugs at my heartstrings. We hear all of this after and there is a part where she is, her truth is coming out, who she is. And I want to get back to that later because there's a part there that I absolutely love, but I can't do it now because we have not been introduced to the character that it involves yet. Back to... <laughs> Chronologically, we're on our way to save Adian. Kale's group has been told to put on red flowers to show that they are the good guys in this. And Alien is Alien. <laughs> Alien <She's> is, <laughs> is gonna go on a rampage. And she does. It is fantastic. But before that, we are introduced or reintroduced to somebody who has been a part of Alien's life. And now I'm gonna say Alien every time, <laughs> but Alien's life, who is Florine. And if you remember, she is the dance instructor that Arabin had Selena going to classes with to kind of learn grace and all of those things that are helpful with being an assassin. And Florine, being the nice person that she is, even after Aelin lost all of her money and connections, Florine kept giving her lessons because Aelin loved it so much without charging her for these. And so Florine is back with Aelin, and this is a suggestion of Lysandra's because she has learned how to go unnoticed, how to be noticed, how to blend, how to be a chameleon. And so she gives Aelin this idea of blending in so that she can go and get Adian. Selena, Aelin, blends in as one of the dancers and gets into the castle that way. And Florine is down for it because she is a pissed off about the king killing the theater people when they sang the songs of the concentration camp countries, right? And so she, and we don't know that he killed them, but they all disappeared. So they put two and two. They, yeah. He killed them. So Florine's there and there's a line that she says, give our king the performance he deserves. <laughs> and you know, that's like the Southern bless your heart. <laughs> Like, give him, give him the performance he deserves. Aelin gives him the performance he deserves and, like, just hacks the hell out of everybody in the castle and causes so much mayhem. It is an Aelin massacre. <laughs> yes. Yes, a massacre. And I told Sandra I want a shirt that reads, ready for the massacre, because I am so down <laughs> for the shit that has has to be happening soon. I am so down. There's a coming to Jesus moment. There's a reckoning. There's a something coming because whew, Aelin deserves it and I'm ready for it. But yes, she she goes on a rampage. She gets Adian out and Adian being Adian is like, well, I sh you shouldn't have rescued me. Like he's, as they keep calling it, the male fae who is very protective of the female and he's like just very protective of her. It's and so, so she's getting him out and Nezrin stops Aelin from killing Dorian because as she told Kale that she would do, she would see if Dorian is still there. And Dorian, as we mentioned, is like losing himself and he hates it and he's being tortured basically. Aelin noticed that and she knew that he would want to be dead over what is happening to him. And so she was about to kill Kill him was stopped and then kale is even more pissed that she was about to kill him which i mean i can see because i mean maybe there's going to be a miracle that happens just like adian and we can get dorian back and i would hate to have like chopped off his head if you know there's a chance that we can get him back like you even see him later on in the book saying that he wished she would have killed him yes it's still you understand where Kaol and Nezrin are coming from, but that scene does a good job of showing where, you know, Nezrin particularly, where her loyalty lies. The whole scene was done so cinematically. You have Aelin coming in with this dance troupe, drama ensuing because, you know, someone hurt her, the new dancer. And so then she's like, 
exiting stage, comes back as a man because she is a taller woman. She's a strong, you know, built woman. And so she's starts to come back like swaggering around like a man and then like avian's like alien um detection just like zeroes in on her and she zeroes in on him and it's like this grand rescue moment with all this bloodshed happening people getting stabbed people getting cut up and the king is getting pissed and they end up fleeing <laughs> And they run back to the safe house, which is Aelin's apartment above the warehouse. And then there's like some kind of fun scenes after, you know, they unload about everything that's transpired. There's some fun scenes that go on with like Aelin and Adian. We get their reunion finally because they haven't seen each other since they were kids in Terrison. So we get that. And then Lysandra comes, you know, over to hang out too. And so you get to see them reminiscing. Mm -hmm. I can't talk today. (laughs) I don't know my words. Reminiscing about their childhood and kind of what that meant to each of them. You get Adian talking about the blood oath a lot and how he's he's willing to take it and he's going to take it and how much of an honor this is. And if you remember what happened at the very end of the, like not Assassin's Blade, but Air Fire, I think. <laughs> Somebody else already took that blood oath <laughs> and he, that's going to be bad. But yeah, you see kind of, I don't remember who's flirting with who, but Lysandra and Adian flirting a little bit. I don't remember who who kind of started that. And it may have been like an offhand flirt. Yeah. But it's probably Lysandra. Yeah, you see a little bit She's of flirtation. She's always using her feminine yeah. files. Just like, and just using like just little quips. And yeah. <laughs> and then you still see Aelin get a little like... <laughs> Like, what? You know, even though they're cousins, you see... He's fine. Aelin gets a little bit possessive. Adian does tell her that she is perfect the way she is because she is a little bit down on herself about Kale calling her a monster and calling her a liar because she did try to kill Dorian. And so Kale, like I said, was very, very agitated. And he kind of lit into her telling her that she is a liar and she's always been a liar and he can't trust her and all this shit when really you're the one who's been a liar. You're the one who's done all this stuff. She has been very honest with who she is except for the fact that she's a queen like that was a secret but other than that who she is as a person has always been there for him and so she was a little bit down on herself and you see adian trying to pick her back Mm. up and be like no you're perfect the way you are and also eliminated a fear that she had which is that adian wouldn't wouldn't like her as the queen anymore if he knew what she had done and so you see them reminiscing about the things that they have done and like trying to one up each other or whatever and be like yeah well you killed those 20 people i killed these 20 people it's good and that was cute even though they were talking about like the bad things that they did it was just like a yeah you're still okay you're still perfect like even if you had to do these bad things i love adian so much even as commander of the bane the king of otterland's army who has killed so much aelin tells him about all the terrible ugly things she's done and he doesn't even bat an eye like he's just like Yep, I get it. Like, I've had to do things I'm not proud of either, but I still love you, you know? And I love that. But your comment reminded me of what I was going to say, because you mentioned Kale and Kale withholding how to bring magic back by destroying the towers that make the corners of the triangle. And so you see a parallel with Aelin withholding the blood oath thing from Adian. It's like, we have grown to love Adian so much because he's just, he's so loyal to her. He has so much honor, even despite everything that he's done. He's, his heart is in the right place. And you want her to just, you know, be open and tell him so that he's not brought down later. And so you see that parallel, you know, juxtaposed against Kale withholding the towers stuff. And so it was it was very interesting. Even though there's so much hate thrown around for Kale and stuff, you see Aelin kind of doing the same thing, but it's like hers comes from a place of not trusting someone's intentions, you know, as a human being, but more for like a love of someone. Like, I, I don't want to hurt him. I don't want him to be upset about this. Like, it was some choice I made to pick someone over him. I think she's also trying to figure out a way out of it. Like a way, you know, like it's known that Terrison, the rulers, only take one blood oath. And that's why it's so important to Adian is he would be the only one. And so since we know that that blood oath has already happened with Rowan, like I think she's also trying to figure out like, could I change things? Could we do something different? And it still be just as momentous? Mm-hmm. 
But then, after all of this, we see somebody else reappear that is not supposed to be here. Rowan comes, and he has kind of bad news for Aelin, because she told him, stay away, you can't be here, you can't use magic, you would just be a fae walking around, like, you can't do anything. I'm happy you're here, because I missed you, but, like, you're not supposed to be here. And so Rowan shares with her that there's another fae that came at the behest of Maeve to track her down. And that is Lorcan, who is a character that we didn't name before, but he is one of the, and shit, I forgot the word. Cadre. <laughs> cadre, yes. One of the cadre of Rowan. And so he's a super powerful fae and he's there to get her. Yes, this is a big dude. He was described as the towering fae in an earlier book. I think it was Air of Fire, whenever the cadre came to Aelin and Rowan's rescue at the place that they were training at. So we didn't know anything about him. So Lorcan has followed them over. So now we have these two full-fledged just fae warriors here. Adian, too, is the only other one that kind of matches them in size, except Lauren is supposed to like kind of dwarf even... <laughs> Rowan and Adian and Lorcan is hot on Aelin's trail he is coming to put her down and we get to see more of Aelin's fun shenanigans she always gets the job <laughs> done and she does it in the most creative way possible there are these creatures called word hounds and they're essentially the gargoyles of the clock tower made to life and they can report back to the king on what they see and they kind of live in the sewers and what do we see Aelin do to deal with Lorcan it's so fun so she basically tricks him into following her down into these like tunnels or whatever and then kind of just leaves him with these things like she she like has the them track her and kind of just like brings them together to where Lorcan has to either kill them and prove that they are killable in the process or he dies so either way it's a win for her like somebody's dying that she wants to die and so you see that and you see rowan like catching on to what she did and he's like you didn't he was like you you did devious little devil yeah you, yeah you <laughs> and and it's hilarious that he's now catching on to that side of her and seeing her like creativity and ability to manipulate the situation into what she wants it to be and lord does survive he looks rough he does end up be beating <laughs> and there is a comment that she makes and it is hilarious because she's like oh you beat all three of them he's like there were six you <laughs> bitch <laughs> and i was like oh she's hilarious and then um so he's he's attacking her and she's just making these little like comments that are just pissing him off even more. And like you see her like just being so snippy. Rowan comes up, but not before she like holds a knife to his groin. And she's like, I wouldn't do that if I were you. Otherwise, you're going to lose your favorite appendage. <laughs> and he he makes another comment. And then she makes a comment about like, it'll be a big mistake. And then Rowan comes up and, you know. Lorcan gives up a little bit and Rowan is having this like debrief with her after he's like did you have to like threaten his dick <laughs> um and she's like well at least I called it a big mistake I was this close to calling it a little mistake <laughs> <laughs> and he, th this is where he's like you brat yeah. And it's just so funny that even in like this moment where almost guaranteed death if she doesn't like get out of this in some way, because Lorcan is that like he's a full fledged fae, he's huge, he is going to win this fight against her. She's just so quippy. She's just like, yeah. not a big deal. Like I don't her care. Rowan was like, oh, he definitely would have killed you if you would have said little mistake. <laughs> it would have been game over. It's so funny. She's like brute and he makes a brat comment. Like even their relationship is just snowballing into this really fun thing too because it definitely did not start that way. It started with a punch to her face <laughs> and lots of like torturous hatred. hatred and training and grueling work and it's like becoming that, that funny little exchange of quips and and snark and that kind of thing and one of the fun things is they can communicate like head to head because of the blood oath so that's like becoming really fun and at the forefront during some scenes because they have some fun looks they share 
<laughs> well, and then you see him meeting Lysandra. And this is the part that I alluded to earlier with Lysandra because nobody knew she was a shapeshifter yet. And she meets Rowan and he calls her out for being a shapeshifter. He's like, what's up, shapeshifter? And she's like, everybody's Aylin's like, what? like hell? what? <laughs> That's real? Yeah. And he's like, I can smell it on you that you're a shapeshifter. And she's like, yeah. And Lysandra had made a comment about his fangs and how much she likes fangs. And he's like, you would know. <laughs> shapeshifter. And it was just, it was a cute little scene of like, he trusted her. She trusted him because of Aelin and their trust in her. And so they're just like quipping each other about her being a shapeshifter and him being a fae because he, he still has his little fangs and her making a comment that she likes anything with big fangs <laughs> and being like Lysandra, like all like, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, listen. I don't know. She's she's doing her feminine wiles thing. Seductive her, with that. Seductress. Mm-hmm. So much fun. And <laughs> but like more about her shape-shifting ability. It's if magic is ever lifted, shapeshifters are feared. Like out of all of the magical creatures that there are, shapeshifters are feared the most because most times they are spies. They are embedded as little moles in kingdoms and they are, if they can't be controlled and employed, then they are just put to death immediately as soon as possible. Like it is very unsettling for anyone to have a shapeshifter around. Well, and you get a scene of vulnerability from Lysandra there too, when everybody figures out that she's a shapeshifter because she turns to Aelin and she's like, basically, are we still friends? Like, do you like, accept me? Are you okay me? with this? Yeah, do you accept me? And Aelin's like, well, like, it might be cool to have you in my team. <laughs> like, I'm sure that you'd be a good, like, spy. I'm sure that you would help. You're already helping, you know? It was just a moment of acceptance, no matter what you did, who you are. If you're on my team, you're on my team. Take notes, Kale. <laughs> Aelin's like, we're ride or die. Mm -hmm. If I choose you, I choose you. We're ride or die. Like even Kale right now, she's still ride or die in Kale. And it's like, he doesn't deserve it. But she is. She's still there to protect him and Dorian as much as she possibly can. And then we find out a few more things about what Lysandra taught Aelin. And who she impersonated when she was came back out as the dude, when she was rescuing Adian, because she impersonated somebody that's very close to Erebin. And she even like waved at somebody who called her by name. And she's been dyeing her hair and doing some things to like mimic this person. And it is somebody that was super close to Erebin. And because of this, he got in trouble and he ratted out Erebin like so quick. He's like, it's Erebin. Erebin's doing all these bad things. And so Erebin rightfully is a little agitated with Selena because he knows exactly who was impersonating this dude that got him in trouble for helping helping save Adian. And he knows exactly why she did it. It's just funny that like even her little plans have little plans in them that like the helping Adian escape parts of that were a part of a different bigger plan and all tied together to get the ultimate outcome that she wanted. And we see that happen right at the end of this or this part of the book. It is so much fun seeing the payoff for all of this because throughout the book, we see Aelin sneaking off, you know, in the middle of the night, she never explains her hair color, and if she does, it's just a snipey comment that's not serious whatsoever. I mean, she does the most random things throughout the book, and the payoff for all of those things coming together and the big reveal is just, like, so perfectly done. Mm -hmm. Like, a few other, like, brief things happen. So it's like, Kale will not trust Aelin, no matter who tries to reason with him. We see Nezrin kind of shut his shit down, too, and calls him out, which was so good. Because we also learned that Nezrin and Kale have been having, like, a little a little fling, you know, when Aelin was abroad in Wendland. He warmed up to her and invited her to his bed. So what right does he have to be jealous and stuff whenever he was like, you know what, I'm going to date and sleep with this girl, even though it's casual. He sucks. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting when Selena figures out what happened because she's like, well, why the hell didn't you kind of tell me? Yeah. You're still working with this lady. I'm supposed to trust her. 
We see Aelin get a better understanding of Nezrin because they kind of share and open up a little bit. And so we kind of got some kind of how she did with Nehemia, right? Just opening up about their families and how they were impacted by this goal of the Empire and stuff like that. So we do see her open up and learn to trust Nezrin a little bit more. But then we also learn some stuff about Adian, our beautiful Adian that I would totally not mind living in an apartment with, <laughs> with him and and Rowan, no. <laughs> even if they burn breakfast, I don't care. <laughs> I'll cook. It's Tara, fine. Tara doesn't like to. <laughs> I don't cook, but I will cook. Um, you wanna you wanna break the news of what's what's special about Adian? Oh yes, I was like, what is special about <laughs> what's Adian? Not? Everything. <laughs> which which part are you talking about, Sandra? So we, through Rowan, Rowan has like this ability to just like smell people and be like, you are a Taurus. You had this for breakfast. I don't know. He just like can like sniff. He's like a a dog. (laughs) But anyway, he kind of tells Adian who his daddy is based off of I've smelled this before kind of a thing. And his daddy is Kitty Cat Boy (laughs) from earlier, Gavriel. And so Adian's mom never told him who his dad was and always kept that a secret like to her dying day would not tell anybody except for Aelin's mom who his dad was and that was for his protection because he knew or she knew that if Maeve ever found out that there was another half Fae being that is part Galathinius and part Ash River, that there would be trouble because they're already looking for Aelin. They already are mad that Aelin exists. They're already, you know, trying to figure out where she is, how they can use her. And so his mom's just like, I'm not going to tell her. And so also didn't tell Gavriel that he had a son because he is blood oathed to Maeve. So if she ever asks him, he has to tell her. And so Gavriel doesn't know that he has a son. And they're trying to keep him away from Lorcan as well, because Lorcan will be able to smell or whatever sense that he is Gavriel's son and then report back to Maeve. Trying to keep this on the very, very, very down low. Adian is a son of one of the oldest and strongest bay creatures alive. It's just that building of the stakes, right? You just, everything that's revealed, the stakes are rising higher and higher. I mean, this is the fifth book that we're covering, right? Yes. Yeah, so we have a few more books to go, but obviously Lorcan is a yes man, so anything is going to get back to Maeve that he can figure out. This is going to be interesting to see where this goes. But on top of that, I mean, there's just so much happening in the first part of Queen of Shadows. All of these reveals, all of these things and character depth that is getting built upon. But we do get some moments of levity, like with the breakfast burning comment that we talk about. Like there's some ooh la la, like some sexy time (laughs) with like Aelin and Rowan. Just some like flirtatious, just testing There was also the time, and this is another reveal later, like one of the biggest reveals that happens in this this section. Rowan snaps at her. No. When she goes to like touch his face and like start some of that sexy time, (laughs) he's like, no, do not touch me. And she's like, okay, I thought we were going that direction, but maybe I misread all of the signals. And so she starts like backing away from him. Like, okay, if that's not what you want, I misread. And so she starts backing away from him even more. And he's like, well, actually I did want that. He, I, I don't know what what's going on in his brain. If he's just scared, if he thinks she's too young for him since he is like 500 years old or whatever. But there's a moment where he's just like, don't touch me. It was, was like, oh. I know it was like having th- cold water thrown on you because it was out of nowhere. This is right after their scene with the pianoforte and her taking him to like the scene, mm-hmm. the Royal Theater and like opening up to him about all of that. There are so many bonding moments between the two. And then he's just like, don't touch me. And then they become distant and weird <laughs> afterward. And this is also with like all of those leading up moments where like there's little comments about her undergarments and her wearing like lingerie and stuff like that. And so, you know, he's into her and you get the very good sense that he's into her and she gets that sense. And then he's just like, 
wall. Yeah. So I think there's a reason for that wall. That was one of the... Yeah. We know that the woman that he loved that he was mated with was murdered and was carrying his child. We know that in taking the blood oath to Maeve, he was then forced to sleep with Maeve, make her happy however way she saw fit. So there could be a lot going on. He's obviously gone through some trauma and having a bad reaction to that. He, after the fact when they're weird, you know, and kind of dancing around it and avoiding each other in scenes where they are thrown together in the same room. You're in his head and he is not able to figure out like why Aelin is being so distant from him. It's like you just snapped at her and shut her down when she was being vulnerable. The woman has only slept with one person ever, which is just is Kale, and you just rejected her. And that was... No. You're like, oh, that was the most vanilla thing ever. And... Kale, like, completely destroyed her trust right after yes. that. So, like, it wasn't the best experience. Maybe the act itself was fun, but, like, the after effects were not. She got her trust destroyed. So the fact that she is willing to enter into that kind of a relationship again and then just gets shut down, it's like, oh, maybe I'm just dumb. Maybe I'm not a good judge of the people who I want to sleep with or something because, like, they're all turning out kind of, like, my my guidar's off. Which, just to be clear, we are not condoning, like, just continuing it on and pressing for sex with people. We are all for no. consent. We're just saying that she put herself out there, was very vulnerable, given everything that's happened, and he was giving her the signals back. And then when it came down to it, just, it was just stopped dead. <laughs> Which is fine. Like, that's his his right. Then after the fact, he's like, what's wrong? Like, why are you acting like this? And it's like, well, I'm acting like this because this is what you told me you wanted. You didn't want me to touch you, so I'm not touching you. Like, She's like, obviously. You made a very clear boundary. I am now willing to kind of Give you- not go along with your boundaries, but like respect, yeah, your, respect boundaries. your boundaries. And he's wondering why she's respecting his boundaries and something doesn't add up. As we're seeing this happen, we hear and we see Arabin gets his just desserts. Finally. And they had a dinner and this is Arabin trying to like be Arabin and be like all powerful and he he forces her and her friends that are living with her in his little note. He like indicates that he knows that Adian's with her and Rowan is with her to come to his house. And they are to bring this vulg creature that they were to have kidnapped or captured for him. And he is kind of calling in this favor that she is owed to him for his help in capturing Adian or not capturing Adian, <laughs> rescuing Adian. And so they get this creature, Aelin being Aelin, is like 18 steps ahead of everybody else. And we figure that out very quickly here. So they go to this dinner and they bring this creature in. Which, by the way, he made her do stuff bef- like to meet him at this dinner. Like she needed to look nice. Yes, yes. So she's... She needed to dress nice. And she also, he sent her a fucking groomer. <laughs> he sent her a special lotion that she had to wear, which is almond scented, which is Arabin's scent. And he did this because he knew Rowan being a full fae who is close to her, even Arabin picked up on the fucking sexual tension here, close to her, isn't going to like some other man's scent on her. And so he's trying to drive like a little like wedge between them because Arabin can't stand other people playing with his things, right? Such a toddler. (laughs) Anyway, but, but what did Rowan? So he makes her do this and makes her dress up. They get there, they pull this person in, ball creature in, and he's like, put him in the dungeon. And so they put him in the dungeon and they come back up. Arabin makes a comment because Rowan, being just as snippy and snarky as Aelin is, also wore said lotion. <laughs> so it it's his scent too now. And he's like, what? You told me I needed to like take a shower. Or, like I was dry or whatever. And so he's also wearing this scent and Aelin's like, oh, I thought it was a little stronger. Like, and so it's just like a little, like a little dig 
at Arabin, like, we know what you were going for and it's not going to work kind of thing. So anyway, they have this little dinner. It's over. Aelin had slipped a note to Lysandra. And we don't find out what that note said until later that evening. And basically the note said, he's all yours. She is giving Lysandra the permission to kill Arabin. Which is huge. Arabin has done uh-huh. so much to Aelin since she was eight years old. For Aelin to say, he's all yours is such a show of trust and just loyalty and especially considering like they had planned this murder together and Lysandra said I'm happy that you are going to be doing it because at least I know that you will not back out yeah so Lysandra had already put her trust in her and Aelin but Aelin gave it right back and she's like I know you won't back out either he took the love of your life too and he took parts of you that you will never get back it's yours and so we see Lysandra murdering Arabin. It's after a night of forced sex and she waits for him to go to sleep. In true Selena fashion, Arabin does not die easy. Lysandra picked up on some of her, you know, more revengey qualities and like just chopped the dude up and slit his throat and let him like choke to death on his own blood. And that scene was just so cathartic for everything that he had done. And if there's ever a murder around me, I am so going to jail for half the things I say on this, <laughs> even if I didn't commit the murder, because there is something to be said about like people who do horrible things getting their just desserts. And we see before this, before he gets his throat slit after screwing her, Arabin is, there is no redeeming moment of this man when he had them over for dinner to hand over the amulet of Orinth, which is the third word key, and this is one of the big things that Aelin has been after, she finally gets that back. This motherfucker tried to slip a ring on her hand when no one else was around. She knew, she anticipated what was going to happen because she knew Arabin wasn't just after this Volg creature to interrogate him. She knew that Arabin knew something was up with these rings and that he was going to take that ring and use it probably against her because he likes to possess her and own her and sure enough he proved her she was like testing him I think one final time because our girl even though she is you know trigger happy and can kill someone easily she still wants to find something good in everybody and she will give them all the chances to prove themselves and he failed and she was like out done. This goes to the, she's right or die. Mm-hmm. Even if you're a horrible human being to her, she still gotcha. And she was trying to not have to kill Arabin for all of the bad things that he did. If she could find one thing that he did good, or one time that he didn't, like, try to, like, manipulate the situation to the worst possible thing and the best to him, but worst for everybody else. So, yes. Yeah, so after that final betrayal against her, to twist the dagger even more, was he had Stevan, which is the Volg that was f- possessing that poor man, brought into the dungeon where Sam's body was. Like, that's how sick and twisty mm-hmm. he is. So he deserved everything that he got. The funny thing is she didn't tell Rowan or Adian what she was doing. Like, that was hidden. Like, that she had made a new ring and put it on the Volg's hand so that he would find the new ring because she'd already cut off the finger of the other one. So he was, like, the Volg creature was no longer being possessed at this point in time like the guy was just giving the answers but he was so far gone he wanted to die again going back to dorian wants to die like these creatures have tormented these people so much that they just want to die they remember everything horrible that the creature has done with their body as if they did it and he was ready to die and he went along with this because selena promised him he would die yeah so even though she gave the honors to lysandra to slit this fucker's throat she still takes his head like she still goes back in there and takes Arabin's head just to make sure he's dead and that's end of part one of the book but before that we see something else that she did very manipulative yes so we see her be told that Arabin has died she goes into the keep she's mad and wondering who the fuck killed him and she's gonna get revenge and blah 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 and so she goes into this keep and she meets 
the three kind of assassins under, straight under Erebin. That's Turn, something that starts with an H, and I don't remember the last Clarice one, but the three. is there. No, Clarice is the, Mullen. like, um, this, Clarice is after there, yeah. this. So she sees these guys, and she's like, tell me what happened, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, well, you don't live here anymore. She's like, I don't fucking care. Tell me what happened. Let me see the body. And so she goes in, and she's like, oh. Lysandra did good in her head. And so she comes back out and she's still acting like she's livid that somebody had the nerve, the gall to kill him. And Lysandra's sitting there all bloody because she slept in the bed with Arabin and somebody came in and murdered him. And so she's got like blood all over her and Clarice is there and Clarice is there because Lysandra belongs to her as well as she's expecting a will to be read and she's expecting to get quite a bit in this will, right? And so we see the guy come and he reads the will and every fucking thing was left to Selena, his true heir. Clarice is beside herself because she was told by Arabin that she was in the will. There is a little caveat in the will. That is that what was owed to Clarice goes to Clarice. So like the little bit of debt he had for, I don't know, probably some other girl that the douche was sleeping with and paying for goes back to Clarice. And so Aelin's like, um, you were in the will. You get the money that he owed you. Sit down, shut up, dumbass. So you see that. And then she storms out and Lysandra kind of like goes after her and she's like, yeah, we, we got it. We got this good. Selena kicks all of the other assassins out out of the key. And they're like, you can't do that. And she's like, um, excuse me, did you not just read in the will that I own everything? And as the owner of everything, I get to decide who's here. And I decided that you're not here. Like basically just kicks them out. Or they could purchase everything from her. And they're like, we don't have that kind of money. And she's like, well, then I guess you're getting kicked out. Like so sad for you. So sad. And so they figure out a way to like come up with the money and they're going to meet her back there the next day. And so they leave because she's like, get the fuck out of my key. And then we find out that all of that sneaking around that Selena was doing and going to the bank was so that she could replace the will that left pretty much everything to Clarice with her being the person that everything was left to so that she could fund the war that is coming up. Her comment to Adian was hilarious because he's like, what the hell? Why did you do all this? And she's like, but you said we needed money for the war. So I got it for you. Aren't you happy? She's so resourceful. <laughs> it's just I so love great. Her. There's like a couple other things that I wanted to just end on because we did find out something really interesting about back in Morath. We did find something interesting about the witches that they are half fae and half Volg. Because the Volg, as you remember, they have been around a long, 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 long time since the ancient line were ruling everything in Aurelia. We find out that the witches are half Volg, half Fae. And it makes you wonder, because this is something Manon grapples with a lot, is whether her nature is to be a monster or if she was nurtured to be that way. So she has a lot of soul searching in that she doesn't know if the way she is is because she's half Volg or if it's really uh, because of her grandmother. The Crokin witch that she had to kill for the red cloak in the earlier book has been on her mind a lot lately and so I think we might be seeing like some shades of guilt there and some re-examining of where her loyalties and priorities lie so I thought that was an interesting observation and then I just wanted to call out with the character of Elid because we saw her mother Marion the laundress and how much she sacrificed to save Aelin when she was little in helping her escape the assassin fascination job. We see that Elid has been through so much loss and because her ankle got fucked up in all of the events that happened and it just never healed right and she has basically been enslaved by her uncle, she has had to learn to survive too in her own way. And so one of the things that I liked about this is seeing how calculating and smart she is because she is very smart and observant in how she sneaks around and presents herself to people. She also told the witches that like Aelin was her queen and she was waiting for her to come back kind of a little bit about the story that happened that her loyalty lies mm-hmm. to Aelin. Yes. So she's up front. And that she was hoping she would come back 
back sooner, but she didn't. And so she's just hoping that she's okay kind of thing. I mean, you just feel so bad for Alid because you see her kind of just creeping about, like dragging her ankle around this place. And she runs into her uncle being very sleazy with Caltaine. You feel for Caltaine because she has absolutely no control over herself anymore. It's sad. He has Caltaine pressed up against a wall at one point and is like groping her, like pulling her dress down. You also saw that some of the bruises that she had were like around her wrists and stuff. And so to me, that kind of pointed to sexual assault that they were like holding her down and stuff. So yeah, you feel bad. And I know I was down on both Lysandra and Caltaine <laughs> and I should have been down on Kale instead. <laughs> but anyway... You do feel bad for pretty much every woman in this book so far. Like every woman has been used as a pawn in some way. One thing that's a little unclear still about Caltaine is that little weird thing that she has in her arm. It's like, okay, did they embed her with something too? Because she's collared. But she has shadow fire. Yes. They make her display her power and it's almost like Aelin's and, but it's like a burning power that you can't see. It's like this shadow that envelops the body and then the person just like, she can bring them to their knees. Like they are literally on fire suffering and being tortured, but it doesn't look like that. It's like Dakota Fanning's character in Twilight. Yeah. I remember that. She, she's got that, like she sends out the pain. Mm -hmm kind of thing. I wanted to ask you a question because I kept getting like a sense that this dress was important and I was I think I may have forgotten something. But the dragon dress that she wears to the dinner with Erbin, there's something about that dress because they keep mentioning the dress and she's only worn it once. She's never found a time to wear it in the past. For some reason, like in my mind, I was like, is this a dress that she like got in Assassin's Blade? Yes. I think there was a very brief scene in Assassin's Blade or maybe it was earlier in this book because they're basically poking around in her closet in her apartment and they're like oh you never wear this this is beautiful mm -hmm. and it it brings back bad memories of Sam because she had a lot of things from when she was with Sam and the, how things were supposed to go with him. So it was a dress that she never I, got to wear. That's what I was, I was like, I figured that, but I didn't know if there was something more like specific, like, because at that point in time, Arabin was also gifting her dresses and stuff. So I didn't know if maybe there was a call out to this is one that he gifted her. And so it was like basically an F you back to him. I don't think this one was gifted. I think this was like a Sam call out. That's just another thing. Like this part felt like the closing, the final closing of a book with all of this stuff with Sam. But she was, she'll never forget Sam. Like he is a part of her now. And I just, I love how everything has been done with how she carries, whether it's Nehemia or Sam or her parents, how she just carries all of the loss on her shoulders and it's never forgotten. It just empowers her even more. We shall see what happens in part two. <laughs> yes and part two is smaller than this part it's only like what it's only 300 pages <laughs> 300 pages a lot smaller you have a whole week to read oh, it oh we didn't even talk about sam's grave oh yeah and the pebbles uh-huh she she took rowan because this is this all happened before rowan snapped at her too it was part of that getting close mm -hmm. and bonding and opening up like she actually invites rowan to go to the grave like sam's graveyard because she had been avoiding that up until this point point. and wesley had the grave person come back and write beloved on his tomb because Arabin wouldn't even let that happen because he's a douchebag. I am so ready to not talk about Arabin anymore or Kale. I don't want Kale to die because he's not Arabin level, but yeah, I, I just want him to go away. I definitely don't remember hating Kale this much, my original read through of this. I think we'll, we'll see how I feel after reading Tower of Dawn because that one completely separates from Aelin in the main crew and is Kale focus. I'm so interested to see how you you handle that or don't <laughs> yes I'll shut up about that now but I I need to like stop saying things because like when I say oh I like Kale then he turns into the douchebag that I didn't want him to turn into or oh I like Dorian nope Dorian gets collared oh I don't want to hear anything else about Kale oh there's a whole fucking book about Kale alone mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I really want to see let's see what do I not want like <laughs> 
Yeah. Who knows what's going to happen in part two of Queen of Shadows. The amulet of Orinth is back. It's the third word key. I think the king does have the other two, right? There's still this problem with Maeve. Mm -hmm. Lorcan is still out there, even though he can kick the ass of multiple word hounds at once, apparently. But And he is pissed now <laughs> because she, pissed. she got the better of him. I, I'm going to do a call out because I also love the scenes with Adian, who is like a fan girly. <laughs> over over Rowan and it is hilarious cuz he is so like he's like oh i've heard stories so many stories about everything he's so eager and it's so great but then the poor little dude finds out that Rowan took the blood oh and he is like mad and Selena's like well maybe you could do it too and he's like no there's only ever one she's like well then maybe you could do something else okay like it's fine so that's something we will hopefully see a resolution to is like the anger that he holds that Rowan kind of took his birthright away from him yes and I think news gets back even about the witches and the weird things that are happening that gets back so there's obviously Aelin now it's on her radar that things are happening in Morath that she's probably going to have to you know turn to and deal with in some way also the king of Otterland has just been setting entire parts of the city on fire to purge like the shadow market like he just completely set that bitch on fire after Adian was rescued so things are being upped a lot so there's going to be a lot of drama happening with the word key with the vogue with these word hounds with these creatures that are being bred in the mountains and everything is starting to build and come together but now that she has the resources to fund her own army you know assuming more of that queen power that she has and is due it's going to be interesting all of this shit colliding and tara is ready for it <laughs> I am. Any any last words? Nope. Just that I hope you guys are ready for it too. We are so ready for it. It's coming. Mm -hmm. Book five books almost down. So we will see you next Tuesday for part two of Queen of Shadows by Sarah J. Mass. After that, we only have a few books left. We hope you enjoyed this discussion of part one and leave us a comment if there's any other you know parts that we didn't mention or if you disagree with Tara or me. <laughs> hey, I don't know why the emphasis was on my name there. But also, if you guys are enjoying the podcast and you're listening on Spotify, make sure you rate the podcast. That helps us so it much. Help. Thanks for listening. And we will see you next week. Bye. Bye.